Hello guys, welcome back to the DNN Medical Series. I'm Damar, I'm here with a brand new tutorial video. So today, we're going to talk about blood donation and storage. So guys, it's very important for you to donate blood if you can, if you meet the criteria, which we're going to look on today, ensure that you donate blood, because this could save somebody's life. And as usual, the blood bank has limited amount of blood supply, so ensure that you help them by donating blood all right so there are different type of donor for blood there is a voluntary donor as in this is the best one so you just go in and say okay i'm a volunteer i want to donate blood it's for no specific reason or for no specific person replacement this is a type of donor where the blood bag has some blood right you have a family member or friend who is going to use this blood and then you give blood to replace what has been used by that family or friend all right directed is where blood is given to a specific person so you need your blood to go to somebody in particular that you know so unlike replacement where they get somebody else's blood and you just replace it the directed donor gives to somebody who is specific all right for the autologous donation is you donating blood to yourself. You can say, how can somebody um, do this? So if you know that you have a surgery coming up in six months, you can actually donate blood for yourself and allow them to store it in case of any emergency during surgery, they can use your blood. And apheresis is basically where you donate a particular type of blood component or blood. So you can donate your red blood cells, you can donate your platelets, or you can just donate your plasma. So let's look on the stages of blood donation. So the first stage is the most important is the selection process. Um, the guidelines are given to the donors. So we need to ensure that the donor won't be at risk, any health risk during the process of donating blood or the recipient is protected so that there is minimal chances of basically transmitting infectious agent to the recipient, all right? So the donation process is necessary for the registration of the patient, which we'll get to, to educate the patient and also solicit information such as medical information and social information, as well as do a physical examination of the patient now for the donor registration process you're basically asking the donor to identify themselves so they must have proper identification their full name their age and for age it should be between 17 to 60 unless you're an allergenic donor where the upper limit may be up to 65 all right so they're asking for your address your telephone number in case to contact you um, after they have evaluated your blood Date of the last donation is very important because if you have donated blood recently, then you'll have to wait two, two to three months in order to donate whole blood again. Occupation, if you're doing a job that requires a lot of energy and input, so you're a trainer or bus driver where you're operating heavy machine or um, you're on duty a lot, which is very rigorous and strenuous then you want to donate blood when you're off duty right and the last thing in the registration process if you are going to donate this blood to anybody in particular whether it be a replacement donation or a directed donation so next you want to educate the donor to say what the donation process is like any risk that may develop they may develop a hematoma they may faint or things like that all right also the risk factor for infectious disease right and this is the time where the donor can either ask for more information if they are not sure or to defer from doing this all right so the next process we're going to look on is very important is the history of the donor all right so now we're looking on donor history so this is where we review the past medical illnesses or any treatment that the patient has received this is more important for like a allergenic transfer which is to others rather than to yourself it is if it's autologous sorry all right so you're going to review the past history as we said before so permanent deferral 
With these, you cannot donate blood any at all, not now or any time in the future. So if you have any cancer or malignancies, if you have any bleeding disorders such as hemophilia, A or B, if you have HIV, if you are an IV drug user, or if you have the HDLV antigen, which is seen in a lot of malignancies. Now, temporary deferrals, these include like a one-year deferral would be if you have a blood transfusion in the last year, if you have a tattoo or a body piercing. However, if it's from a licensed company, they may allow you to donate blood. Also, if you've been traveling to like Africa or other regions where malaria is endemic, then they may defer you because of that. If you've been in prison for more than three days or 72 hours, then you'll be deferred for one year. Other reasons for deferral could mean that you're pregnant. So if you're pregnant, you have to wait um, up to six months after you have given birth for donation. Also, if you've done a recent live vaccine, then you may get deferred for like a two to four week period. And if you're on certain medications such as aspirin that will affect your blood, then you may also get temporary um, deferral. Next is the physical examination after the history was taken. So you're going to look for anemia by checking the mucosa. You're going to look for things like jaundice. You're going to look for markings on the patient suggesting there has been drug use, right? Weight, you need to check the weight to ensure they're at least 50 kilogram. And if they're donating blood, the volume of blood that they're donating should not be more than 15% of their total blood blood volume you're going to check blood pressure so the diastolic shouldn't be greater than 100 and the systolic shouldn't be greater than 180 you're going to check the pulse to ensure that it's normal between 50 and 100 and you're going to check to see that their hemoglobin content is at least 12.5 grams per deciliter for allogenic donation which is donating to another person and 11 for autologous donation all right, so the next stage is the collection of the blood and storage. So of course, they're going to use aseptic technique and they're going to use a large bore vein in the anticubital fossa, is near the elbow region, right? And they're going to collect the blood in a bag, as you will see, and the bag containing an anticoagulant called the CPDA1. All right, so this is the most widely use anticoagulant in blood collection so this collecting bag and this cpda1 anticoagulant consists of citrate phosphate dextrose and adenine and so it's important for you to know the function of these so citrate now prevents coagulation by getting rid of the calcium phosphate acts as a buffer to control a decrease in pH. So because there's going to be glycolysis and the buildup of lactic acid, the acidity can be dangerous for the blood cells. So the phosphate is there to buffer it to ensure that the pH is kept at a normal pH. The dextrose supports ATP generation via glycolysis and adenine is a substrate for ATP synthesis. All right, so with optimal additive, um, they basically have a solution containing sodium chloride, which is salt, glucose, mannitol, and also adenine. So after they have treated the blood with citrate, they basically would put it in the optimal additive solution and this just increase the survival of the red blood cells. So after that process, of course, they go, they're going to test it. So before the blood can be released to the patient, there needs to be testing of the blood to ensure that there isn't any infectious agent that is present. So in Jamaica, we're going to test for the ABO resus group, so to know your blood type. Also, if there are any reactive antibodies that are present in the blood, we're checking for syphilis in particular as STDs. We're checking for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HTLV1 and 2, HIV1 and 2, and CMV. And to note, we're checking for the antibodies for HIV 1 and 2 and the antibodies for HTLV 1 and 2. All right, so CMV in particular is not really routinely done, 
but if there is particular immunocompromised patients that are receiving the blood, then you want to ensure that the blood doesn't contain CMV in particular. And the most common test that is used is the NAT test, um, especially when we're needing the result for HIV or hepatitis. In short window period, patient really um, needs the blood, then this can be a test that is used. All right, so that's it for this video. See you in the next one. Goodbye.